So some of you may know this, it might be new to some of you, but what I want to get into is why Jesus actually had to die. Why was that the only answer? This is the, the, the being that all things were created through. John says all things were created for him, by him, right? Through him. So how come this much of a powerful being had to take on human flesh and die? You know, a lot of people might say, well, he had to die for my sins. And that's true. But he was forgiving sin before he died. So that wasn't it. Because he could forgive sin while he lived. Right? Because he was forgiving people all over the place. As long as they didn't sin no more. Right? So we're going to get into what that is. And you've heard mentioned in the, in the Bible, Paul talks about it a lot, is this mystery. And what I'm going to talk about today is part of what that mystery is. Anybody ever wondered that? Why was that the only way? The person that created everything. The very first thing created was the Word of God. In the beginning, God created the Word of God, and then the Word of God created everything else. So, so what? Right, and that's what John was talking about. And if you read any Hebrew scroll, it'll say, in the beginning, God created, and then there's the Aleph Tav there, which... And the Strong's, it actually has a Strong's number, 853, which says undefinable. We don't know what this is, but it's important enough because it shows up 7,000 times in the Old Testament alone. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, you know that thing you can't define is me. I am the Alpha and Omega. That's what that means in Greek. I am the beginning and the end, the first letter, the last letter of the alphabet and everything that's created from it. God, the creator of the universe, chose to give us his instructions, his character through words. That's how he chose to talk to us, through words. So much so that his word took on human form and had to die. So that's what we're going to get into. But Romans 16, verses 25 through 27 now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the, be since the world began, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God alone, wise, be the glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So, <clears throat> let's go back. We're going to learn some history. When the Hebrews, the tribes of Israel, were in bondage in Egypt, they were delivered out in the Exodus. <clears throat> it took them seven weeks to leave Egypt and get to Mount Sinai. Three months. If you read it closely, it says in the third month they approached the mountain. Now in that time, they crossed the Red Sea, they were fed manna, they actually fought a war with the Amalekites, and then they approached the mountain. That mountain, whole setting, was a wedding. God said in Exodus 19.5, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the world is mine. And then Exodus 19.8, The people said, All that God, the Lord has spoken we will do. I do. These were the I do's of the wedding. Just like when you have a wedding today of a man and a woman, you commit yourself to the other person, and then you ask the other person, do you accept this? And what do they say? 
I will or I do. Jerry and Renee just did this a few months ago. If you will obey me and I obey you, we will be one. Do you accept this, right? Uh, every wedding has that. It's a covenant. It's a, it's a covenant of marriage. The Ten Commandments were spoken out loud in Exodus 20 as they approached the mountain. Everybody heard it. These were God's demands. If you will obey these, you will be a special people to me. If not, you know, we'll pick something else. But they, the people heard this so much that they got scared. They thought they were going to die. If you read Exodus 20 there, they heard all these commandments. And they're like, Moses, you go talk to him. This is going to kill us. So Moses was the officiator of the wedding. He was the priest. And he goes up and, you read it closely, he goes up and down the mountain quite a bit before all this is said and done. He'll go up and say, the people accept your offer. Okay, we'll go tell them this. And he goes down and tells them that. And they say, okay, go tell them this. And he goes back up several times. Read it. That wedding, Mount Sinai, seven weeks out, is the day of Pentecost. That's when God shouted down his commands. That's when the wedding took place. It's the 50th day. That's what Pentecost means, 50th day. So, and since it was a mixed multitude, 1447 B.C., right around there, could be 1448, whatever, close enough, the mixed multitude that was there, they were Hebrews, all 12 tribes of the Hebrews, Egyptians, Canaanites, other people they might have picked up along the way, Amalekite slaves, we don't know. But there was a mixed multitude. They all spoke different languages. But God spoke audibly, and all of them heard the commandments, which means God spoke in multiple tongues. Same thing happens in Acts. Right? Same thing. God speaks through the people in multiple languages, and everybody heard it in their own language. So there's always a reference, New Testament and Old Testament. Everyone heard the conditions. That's why when Moses was up on the mountain, God says, go down, Moses, because your people have already corrupted themselves and broke what I just told them not to do. So there's proof that they heard it. So, once this goes on, they're in the wilderness for 40 years. They cross into the promised land. Right, you go through the whole judges. They're being prepared for this marriage that they just accepted. Right, just like in the book of Esther, it took her a long time to prepare herself for her king. Right, it wasn't just like today where you meet somebody at McDonald's and run down to the, the local, you know, chapel like in Vegas and get married on, on the spot. Back then, and culturally, the bride took sometimes years or her whole life preparing for her husband. That's what we, we should be, because one day we will be part of the bride, and I'm going to get into this later. Are we preparing ourselves properly for that? Right? So once King David sets up a man after God's own heart, his kingdom, this is when the actual, what, what would you call it, consummation of this marriage happened under King David and King Solomon. I'm going to show you a picture here, if my thing works. This is King David's empire. If you can see it right there is Jerusalem. All this in red is under King David's direct control. And all this up here is influenced by King David with treaties and things like that. King Solomon's empire expanded even more. So all this in red was the territory of David when he became king. The orange is the conquered by David, inherited by Solomon. And this yellow area up here was a strong economic influence of Solomon. 
So in modern day, this goes all the way up into Syria, right, all the way down to Sinai, Egypt, over into Saudi Arabia. It was a big kingdom. But actually, the land that God promised them is like four times that size. So anyway, this is when the end of David's kingdom, beginning of Solomon's kingdom, is the honeymoon. Because everything was running the way God wanted it to. His bride was functioning the way it was supposed to. And that's what the book of Song of Solomon is about. Song of Solomon is a love story. And it's a love story between Solomon and his queen, but it's a shadow picture of the love story of God and his people. You agree, Dennis? So, this goes on for quite a while until Solomon's eyes get turned away because he starts breaking some of the commandments God gave on intermarrying with foreign people and bringing in foreign gods. Right? Because people can get distracted. Same with us. When you're first a new Christian, you're in love with Jesus, and then eventually that newness wears off, unless you keep striving for it, unless you keep digging into the Word and making it new every day. If you do not reconstitute yourself to the Word, you will be distracted. And then other things start becoming your God. Even your phone can become your God. Right? So this goes on, and God gives warnings. And eventually the kingdom is split. Into two kingdoms. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Israel's to the north. Judah to the south. Now, they're still married to God at this point, but they're split into two kingdoms because they start doing different things. In Deuteronomy 28, 64, Moses gives them a warning. Then the Lord will scatter you among all the people for from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known of wood and stone. So Moses warns them, if you go in and you start accepting what they're doing, and you do that, God will split you in half. They used to kill animals in the Old Testament. And a good example is Abraham. He cuts the animals in half and walks through the pieces. Right? You've read that? And what that means is you're making a vow to God if... I break this covenant, what happened to this animal will happen to me. I will be divided. You'll be killed. And that, I mean, that sounds weird to us. We're not in a culture like that, but they still do things like this over in the Middle East. They still have ceremonies like this. They still offer sacrifices on things like that at, at, the, at the house. You know, that's, it was a blood covenant. But... <clears throat> They, when they entered into the covenant with God at Mount Sinai, they were basically saying, hey, if we violate this, we will be divided in half. And they violated it, and the kingdom was split into two. There were ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south, and the Levites were mixed amongst all of them. So this, this is going to help you with understanding who we are. Who is our identity? Who are we in this whole picture? So once these, after this split, the northern kingdoms in the Bible are called the house of Israel. You will see that after this. In the Bible, it's the house of Israel. And the southern kingdoms is the house of Judah. Do you know where the word Jew comes from? The house of Judah. So whenever we're reading in the Old Testament, we think it's Jewish. You're only talking about one of the 12 tribes. 1 Kings 11, verses 31 through 33. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of Solomon, 
the hand of Solomon and give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David, which is Judah, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worship Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Shemesh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the, the god of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father David. The southern tribes are made up of Jews, Judah, which be, later becomes the Jews, Benjamin, and parts of Levi. The ten northern tribes are called the house of Israel, Israel, the house of Jophus, or Ephraim. After, after you see this split in the Bible, this is it. The house of Israel is the ten northern tribes. The house of Judah is the southern tribes, which became, or was made up of Benjamin as well. But Benjamin had to absorb the ways of Judah, the Jews. Okay? So if, if, if you got any questions, stop me. If not, I'm going to assume you understand what's going on. I'm going to uh, show you some of these gods that they were worshiping. This is Ashtoreth, Ishtar, Isis, or Easter. This is what they were worshiping, gods of wood and stone, fertility gods. And there are many people that still do this today in some form. They don't even realize that they're doing it. The whole fertility god thing comes from ancient Babylon. Comes from the Tower of Babel, from Nimrod. Shemesh, Baal, Molech, and Tammuz are all the same god too. So they, these, this is what they were worshiping. Thinking that they were doing it for God. But they weren't. And he, he told them, do not go in there and worship me like they worship their gods. He gives them that warning. Do not do what they do to their gods and say you're doing it for me. Now what does that mean for us today? Well, God knows my heart. I can worship him however I want to. And that's not true. We can't just do what we want and say this is for you. Now keep thinking this is a wedding. It's a marriage. If you're a husband and you walk in and your wife is kissing another man and she says I'm doing this for you how well are you going to accept that right you know my heart I was thinking about you when I was kissing him it wouldn't go over very well would it you'd be like oh, okay you must love me so think about it in terms of like that God gave us natural marriage down here to try to understand what we're going to live like for the rest of eternity with him it's not going to be a male and female thing, right? But the, the covenant, the bonding, the living together, the sacrifices you have to make to make a marriage work is what we have to do with God. So, in doing this, the ten northern tribes eventually start serving gods their own way. The tribe of Dan sets up a temple, just like the one in Jerusalem, up in Dan and starts sacrificing there and when they did that God had enough and he gives Israel a certificate of divorce we're going to get into that Jeremiah turn O backsliding children says the Lord for I am married unto you and I will take you one of a city and two of the family and I will bring you to Zion he's telling them Turn back. We're married. Don't do this. The whole chapter of Jeremiah 3 is about this. Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Again, Isaiah is warning them. Your husband is your maker. Now, according to the covenant that I made with their families in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them. 
So there's proof of what I just said. When I brought you by the hand, took your hand out of Egypt, I became your husband. You became my bride. Ezekiel 16, 8. Now, when I passed by thee, and I looked upon her, thee, therefore, thy time was the time of the love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and I covered thy nakedness, yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, says the Lord God, and thou became mine. See how that's wedding language? The Lord said to me, un, said unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree there and played the harlot. Now you see what I'm talking about? God considers you worshiping other gods as adultery. You're cheating on him. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, because but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So God is separating. He's talking to Israel, the ten northern tribes, going, stop. I know you're separated now from Judah, but you're still my bride. Stop acting like this. The ten northern tribes... Israel is the only people in the Bible, the house of Israel, called the lost sheep or the scattered sheep. Right around 7, 740 B.C., God sends in the Assyrians to start in capturing the ten northern tribes. And it goes on for about 40 years. through three different Assyrian kings, even the Samaritans. They actually tried to capture Jerusalem, but God protected Jerusalem. He protected the Jews. He allowed the rest of the Hebrews, the northern tribes, to be taken slaves, the ones that didn't heed the warnings of the prophets. Some of them actually heard the prophets like Jeremiah and all those guys, and they're like, whoa, we better get out of here, and they left. They went somewhere else. Jeremiah 50, 17, it says, Israel is like scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria devoured him. Now the last of this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon has broken his bones. Many Israelites heeded the warnings of the prophets, left willingly. They were scattered amongst the nations. And from then on they were called far off. Those that are far off. I have this map. I don't know if you can see it all, but right in here is Israel. Once this happened, they go into Assyria, and from Assyria, they get spread out through the whole world. And then they, are, they become intermixed with those of the nations, and are then called Gentiles. Gentiles means of the nations or non-Jews non-house of Judah. Does that make sense? So Gentiles were first made up of the ten northern tribes of the Hebrews. We, this is where a lot of people get confused because we think of just the Bible people, God's chosen people, as just Jews, and that's not true. There was 12 more tribes. But those 12 tribes were scattered around everywhere. And some of them came here. Some of them were Native Americans. And we'll get into why that happened in just a minute. So, you can see why they are called those that are far off. Because they're no longer here. God divorced them. We're going to get into this in a minute. And God, the main reason... This is going to happen. The reason why Jesus had to die is God will not ever go back on his word. Now, there are incidents in the Bible where people got God to change his mind, but he didn't go against one of his commandments. It was something that would come up like he was going to destroy all of Israel. He told Moses, step back, I'm going to kill them all, and I'm going to start over with you. 
I'm going to make a new nation out of you. And Moses said, oh, let's do something different. Right? So you can get God to change his mind on a situation, but he will never change his word. Do you agree? If he gives a commandment, it is everlasting. Forever your word is established in heaven. Right? So, keep in mind, we're going to go over what far off means. Matthew 15, 24. This is Jesus. Speaking, words in red. Dennis talked about this last time. He answered unto them and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I only came for the house of Israel. I didn't come for the Jews. I didn't come for the pagans. I didn't come for anybody. I only came for the ten northern tribes that were scattered everywhere. And keep in mind, because this is where we're going to fit in. We have to be grafted in to the whole house of Israel. That's what it's called later. Not the split house of Israel. The whole house of Israel. The two branches will be grafted in. Have you heard that? This is what this means. This is where Jesus is going with this. He's going to take that split branch and put it back together. But these ones of the nations are spread everywhere. They lost their identity that they were God's formal bride. Ezekiel 11.6 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Which means, I've spread them out all over the world, but they will find sanctuary. They're still mine. The book of Hosea backs this up. If you can read the book of Hosea in a spiritual sense, you will see what this is talking about. Isaiah 23, 7. This is your joyous city, whose antiquity is from ancient days, whose feet carried her far off as to dwell. These, this, this reference shows up all the time. And then there are promises about Israel being restored. In Micah chapter 2, verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob, and I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of a fold, like flock of the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise and become so many people. It's a promise. But there's a trick to this. Ezekiel 34, 12. As the shepherd seeks out his flock, on the day he is among the scattered sheep, which is the northern Israel, so I will speak out my sheep and deliver from them all the places, deliver from all the places where they have been scattered on a cloudy and dark day. So all these promises are coming from these prophets going you guys, don't worry, it's going to get fixed. Now, what, what is the big deal with that? So Jeremiah 3.8, let me read this real quick. Then I saw for all of the causes which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, there's another marriage term, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear and went on and played the harlot as well. But he divorced the northern tribes didn't divorce Judah or Benjamin. Now, most of the New Testament was written by Paul, who was a Benjamite. He was part of the tribe of Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin were not divorced. They're still married today to God. That's why they're protected. That's why, from the beginning of recorded history, so many people are trying to kill the Jews. Have you noticed it? I mean, they get attacked all the time from everybody because Satan is in control of the, the governments of the world, 
and he's trying to destroy the rest of God's bride before the final bride comes back. So what is this law of divorce? Paul wrote about this. And Paul, being part of Benjamin, was still married. He was part of the bride still. So who better to explain how a bride should act than one that is one? Two people who are lost. Now keep in mind, when you realize this, this is the reason why the Jews hated the Samaritans and everybody else that was scattered far off. They called them dogs. So here's the law of divorce. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her, as it happens, if, she find, if he finds no favor because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if, she later, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband die who took her as his wife, then her former husband who is divorced from her must not take her back to be his wife, after which she had been defiled. For this is an abomination unto the Lord. If you shall not bring sin onto the land in which the Lord God is giving to you as an inheritance. So this is a commandment of God to the Hebrews. And what he's saying is, if a man marries his wife, this is your first marriage, your first love, and you divorce her, she can go out and marry somebody else, but she's going to be a harlot to you. If that second man divorces her or he dies, she cannot come back to you. The Jews knew this. The Gentiles knew this. All the Hebrews knew this. God divorced us. He said it through the prophet Jeremiah. God has divorced you. There is no way you can come back. There's no way God will take you back because he can't. He will violate his own commandment if he does. God will not violate his commandments. You agree? So, how do you fix that? Paul writes about this. How do you fix something? This is why they, the Jews called them dogs. You ruined it. You were part of us. You were part of the bride and you ruined it. You're a dog. You can't come back unless you become a Jew and do what we do, this Pharisee thing. Am I right? So how, how do you fix that? So Paul, in his infinite wisdom, writes to the Romans. Now, it says in here, Romans 7, verse 1, Know you not brothers, so he's talking to his brothers. Then he says, For I speak to them that know the law. Well, he's not talking to pagan Romans. He's talking to Gentiles scattered into Rome and become part of the Roman society. A pagan Roman who worshiped Zeus would not know the law of God. So Paul's not talking to them. And he clearly states it there. I'm talking to my brothers who know the law. What law is he talking about? This law of divorce. Know ye not, brothers, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. For if the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, while her husband lives, she is married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, then she is free from that law, so that there is no adultery, though she be married to another man. 
And verse 4 is the kicker. This is the solving of this problem. Therefore, my brothers, you have also become dead to this law through the body of Christ, that you can be married to another man, him who was raised from the dead. What he's saying is, you can't come back as long as your husband is alive. But if your husband dies, you're free from that law and you can remarry him. How can that be? Well, if your first husband dies and raises from the dead, you're free. So what is sin? Sin in John 1, 1 John 3 and 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresses the law. For sin is transgression of the law. Would you agree with this statement? God cannot sin. So, so then how can God remarry without breaking his own law? How can God remarry who he divorced when his commandments says it was a sin to do so? There is only one way for the northern tribes who become us. We are scattered amongst the nations. We are grafted in. The church is grafted in through these northern tribes. We don't have to become Jews. But the only way we could re-enter that covenant of marriage is with the death of the husband. When he died, he set us free so we can be remarried to him. He died for his bride. Right? He died so he could remarry her. And that's what Revelation is all about at the end, the wedding supper. Right? We don't have to become Jews because God's protected them for a reason. You know, they kept some of the things going that needed to keep going that would have got lost in pagan corruption of church. There's so much paganism in church today, we don't even see it. So God set them aside and blinded them on purpose. They don't see Jesus as the Savior. They don't see him as a Messiah. They know he was a teacher. They know he was a rabbi. But God allowed that to happen. And even today, he's still allowing that to happen. And it's going to be the northern brothers that we are grafted into that come and open Judah's eyes and say, this is it. We're like you again. We can be married to him. We can be a whole house of Israel again. Hosea 2, I told you Hosea 2 is a good example of this. Dennis quotes this sometimes. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her the vineyards from there and the valley of anchor at the door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth. <clears throat> as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. He's referring to Sinai, the days of her youth when my bride was healthy. And in that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer my master. That is the promise that we have. In Revelation 19, 6 and 7, and I heard as if it were a voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, and as the sound of a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So that's who we are in Christ. We became, if you remember that map, wherever you come from, if you have that desire to be part of God, 
you're part of one of those northern tribes. It's in there. You feel this drawing, right? You're part of the house of Israel. You feel this, this need to be close to God because deep down in our DNA, we once were. And one day, God will open up the Jews' eyes and we will be made one again. One, and then all 12 tribes become the foundation of the new city. That's who we are. That's how we identify ourselves. That's who Jesus died for. So, so we could be remarried to him. So he couldn't break his commandment. That, that's the amazing part of this. <clears throat> and I want to end. The ironic blessing. Does anybody know what that is? Lord bless you and keep you. Lord Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. From a Hebrew perspective, if you break that down, what its literal Hebrew words mean, it's a proposal. It, it, that is, this is wedding language. Because the word bless means to kneel before someone offering gifts. Not kneeling like in subservient, but kneeling in respect. That's what the word blessed means. Barak. Baruch. We say that. Baruch atah. Blessed are you, O God. It means to kneel out of respect. So, the Hebrew transliteration of this is Jehovah will kneel before you presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection. He will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and will give you comfort and sustenance. He will lift up his wholeness of being upon you, and he will set in place all you need for you to be whole and complete. He will kneel before you presenting gifts, which is himself and say, will you marry me? But will you do what it takes to marry me? Will you prepare yourself to marry me? If you will, I will marry you. And that's what Christ will come back and those who have made themselves ready will be standing there, made one as a whole house of Israel, the bride of Christ. That's who we are. So know who you are. And if you feel that drawing, like I said, you don't, we're not supposed to be Jews. But we serve the same God. And in his, this is why his death was important. Because he set forth in motion how, how we can be remarried to him without violating a law. And that's the amazing thing for it all. Amen.